Now the issue of social media is also the most recent one to occur, and a lot of the research on the subject is still up in the air, though there is definitely some tangible information to work with. Ever since the rise of social media platforms like MySpace, Facebook, and YouTube in the early 2000s, as well as the rise of smartphones all over the world, the degree to which our perception of what constitutes meaningful relationships, as well as the way in which we use our time, has shifted dramatically. As Jacob Weisberg wrote in the New York Review of Books in 2016, Americans spend an average of five and a half hours a day with digital media, more than half of that time on mobile devices. Once out of bed, we check our phones 221 times a day, an average of every 4.3 minutes. And according to a 2019 Pew Research poll, about 3 in 10 US adults say they are almost constantly online. And of those ages 18 to 29, 48% say that they are almost constantly online. And I don't think people realize the extent to which they use their smartphones. For me, I use mine as an alarm clock to play music, podcasts, YouTube videos, scrolling through Twitter, texting, checking my mail, checking on this channel, checking the weather, checking the news, and to call and FaceTime relatives. But thankfully, since my phone has been slowly deteriorating, I can't really play that many games anymore or watch any Netflix videos. Though that's also due to a habit of no longer playing video games or really using streaming services. But I can imagine for most people that that's not really the case. This technology is increasingly taking up more and more of our time. And when we're staring at our crotch for five and a half hours, that's five and a half hours you're spending not actually physically engaging with other people. That's five and a half hours of constantly receiving a version of the world that is slightly off kilter, that's catered to what you want to see and how you want to see it. More than that, all of the time spent on social media is deliberately designed so that you get addicted to it and news sites deliberately title their headlines in such a way to make you engage with the content without even having read the material. And when you do click on the article, you'll get recommended a bunch of other clickbaity headlines just so they can make more money off of psychologically manipulating your behavior. And let's be real here. Most people aren't actually reading the articles they click on. If anything, they read the clickbaity headline and then they read maybe the first paragraph and then they're done. Like, retweet, share. Look what kind of bullshit happened today, guys. I'm angry. And this kind of addictive structure of social media and smartphones has been made explicit by the creators. After the first iPad came out, Steve Jobs specifically said that iPads were not allowed in his household, and he will not allow his kids to use them because, quote, we think it's too dangerous for them. Understand that almost every public school uses iPads in the classroom now. We used iPads in my high school, so everyone else's kids can use these dangerous tools, but not mine. Bill Gates similarly limited screen time for his kids and didn't let his kids get cell phones until they were 14. The former president of Facebook, Sean Parker, stated in 2017 that Facebook, quote, literally changes your relationship with society, with each other. We need to give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked your comment on a photo or a post or whatever. It's a social validation feedback loop, exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. A former Facebook executive also said that the company uses short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops that are destroying how society works. The CEO of Snap in 2017 admitted that social media has come at a huge cost to facts, our minds, and the entire media industry, and said that social media sites are designed to fuel fake news and outrage because it's all dependent on what you and your friends share to each other and how that affects the algorithm. As Adam Alter, author of Irresistible, writes about companies like Facebook and Twitter, the companies that are producing these products, the very large tech companies in particular, are producing them with the intent to hook. They're doing their very best to ensure not that our well-being is preserved, but that we spend as much time on their products and on their programs and apps as possible. That's their key goal. It's not to make a product that people enjoy and therefore becomes profitable, but rather to make a product that people can't stop using and therefore becomes profitable. And as he writes in Wired, it seems as if they were following the cardinal rule of drug dealing, never get high on your own supply. But aside from its addictive quality, what the rise of social media and the internet more broadly has done is to give people an avenue to escape into virtual communities. If you can get more joy out of being online and hanging out with Shadow Dude 359, then eventually that's going to replace a lot of the value you do get from being with real people. And more than that, it strains any relationship you do have with real people. If you see your friend post a photo of themselves at the beach, having a great time with other other friends, you're more apt to look at your own life in disappointment because you perceive yourself as not having as good a time as your friend is. This is often the phenomenon that happens with a site like Instagram, where all there is is people posting photos of the best moments of their day, 
And so when you look at these photos, you start to either feel left out or you see yourself as being inadequate. But what we don't realize is that people's profiles are catered in such a way so that they can project onto the world that their lives are fantastic and full of nothing but joy. You're getting a false perception of someone else's life and internalizing that false perception, which consequently makes you more depressed. We'll talk more about this later, but one of the effects this has had is to make people retreat more into their virtual communities on YouTube, Facebook, or 4chan, because at least there you can find like-minded people that don't seem to exist in the real world. But the thing is, this isn't real human interaction. You not only have a barrier between a physical person, but you're removing any engagement of your five senses. Social media claimed to be liberating us from the boundaries of space and time, but it's also made us more isolated and devoid of real community and what it means to be human. As Nicholas Carr argued in his 2011 book, The Shallows, the internet is literally changing the way our brains function. It changes the way we consume information, our tolerance for patience and our behavior. We can hardly concentrate anymore without being exposed to some new flashy image popping up on a screen. People don't think deeply anymore. Many of us can hardly read a book for an hour without the need for something entertaining to distract us. According to a 2014 study from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average American spends only 19 minutes a day reading. How are you supposed to be a serious citizen competent enough to engage in arguments in self-government if you can't even pay attention long enough to consume them? This is even worse for teenagers. Teenagers ages 15 to 19 spend just 4.2 minutes a day reading. And can you guess what's taking up all their time? The internet. Our habitual practices are changing. The way we compartmentalize in our head is changing. The way we think is changing. We're bleeding out our ears! No, I'm just kidding. Though there is a larger conversation to be had about humans and our interaction with technology, but that's not for here. Anyway, all of this is particularly troubling for people in my age range. I'm a Gen Zer, and while I didn't get my first phone until I was 14, the last day of my freshman year of high school actually, for most of my peers, it seemed as though they all got their phones by the time they were in the 6th or 7th grade. And as Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt laid out in the recent book Coddling of the American Mind, the interactions between young people and technology is not something we should be overlooking. Young people are now so anxious that many of us dread to answer the phone, or even call someone over just texting them. Because we've grown up having phones, we're all used to just texting each other and taking our time to write carefully thought out responses. That when we do try to socialize with other people, we're more prone to fits of anxiety because we can't meticulously plan out our responses to other people when we're standing right in front of them. Uh, hey, so, uh, do you like memes? Which only incentivizes the retreat into our phones because at least there we know that we can communicate properly. As much as our phones seem like they connect us, as much as they seem like they make us function properly, persistent use does seem to have some detrimental effects. The forum board or the Twitter thread or the Discord voice chat is not comparable to real face-to-face -face interactions. And it can't be more obvious that this is true when you read some of the most intense hate comments online, only to find out that the person would never actually say such things to you in person. The anonymity factor of the internet allows people to indulge in their worst selves because they face no immediate consequences for it and can hide behind a screen somewhere. But there is a disconnect that occurs with the internet. As Gene Twenge and her co-authors wrote in an article in the Clinical Psychological Science Journal, it is worth remembering that humans' neural architecture evolved under conditions of close, mostly continuous face-to-face -face contact with others, and that a decrease in or removal of a system's key inputs may risk destabilization of the system. A meaningful friendship with someone you physically see is far more valuable than the number you have on your social media account. Being hunkered down and isolated in your home with your virtual friends is not a good substitute. As Andrew Sullivan wrote in New York Magazine, by rapidly substituting virtual reality for reality, we are diminishing the scope of intimate interaction, even as we multiply the number of people with whom we interact. We remove or drastically filter all the information we might get by being with another person. We reduce them to some outlines, a Facebook friend, an Instagram photo, a text message, in a controlled and sequestered world that largely exists free of the sudden eruptions or encumbrances of actual human interaction. Yes, I know, here you are watching me telling you that watching me might not be the best thing for you. Yeah, I, I get it people, but just you, you get the point. But another way in which the rise of social media and the internet have had a damaging impact is in the voice it gives for the most depraved and fringe people of the country. Are you an isolated individual, anxious about your identity and susceptible to sketchy internet blogs ranting about the Zionists? Well, you might just find yourself marching with tiki torches and formulating conspiracy theories about the Holocaust. Little f***ing they get ruled by people like me! Little f***ing oxaroons! I f***ing, my 
my ancestors enslaved those pieces of shit. It, pussy. Race traitor. You work for Jews, you know? It seems almost inevitable at this point that the more isolated you are from real people, and the more you retreat into the internet, the more comfort you find in your virtual community, where you and other internet people can uncover the truth about the worldwide conspiracy theories involving pizza shops and reinforce your confirmation bias. But what's even more disturbing about the internet reinforcing paranoid or racist attitudes is when those unhealthy attitudes actually start to materialize in dangerous ways in the real world. When people become motivated enough to take physical action against people, which leads us to one more aspect of decay that has come with the rise of social media. What social media is really good at is arranging its algorithms in just the right way so that you see just what you want to see. If there is information out there that panders to your most base political beliefs about the other side, it's going to promote it. And it's going to promote it endlessly. More than that, news companies will deliberately title their articles in such a way so as to get this response out of you, and they'll promote the loudest and most obnoxious voices out there just so they can get your click. What social media is really good at doing at the end of the day is promoting intense political tribalism. The belief that all of your political opponents are literally evil people who must all go to prison or something. Neil Gabler wrote in 2016, most of us know the cliches. Social media contributes to more polarization as the like-minded find one another and stoke one another's prejudices and grievances, no matter what end of the political spectrum. Though, despite the fact that it's a cliche, most people continue to buy into it and get agitated whenever they see the latest headline that is designed to trigger them. But what this ultimately does is warp your perception of national politics and the character of your political opponents. And one of the ways in which social media and the news industry do this is by doing something called nutpicking where they find the smallest incident in some town that no one has ever heard of before and then turn it into a national news story and smear everyone who has the same political affiliation as that one person as being representative of the entire group. Some Antifa gangs cause trouble in Portland? That's it. Every single Democrat in the country is communist scum. Al-Qaeda has won. 50 clan members show up to bitch and moan about their superiority? Every single Republican in the country is a Nazi. Dear God, the concentration camps are here. When in reality, these are small incidents with small groups of people and are seriously inapplicable to the entirety of a major political party and are being highly exaggerated and amplified by the media and bad faith actors online. Moreover, this makes it harder for actual despicable people to be shunned from the public debate when one side or the other claims that all Democrats or all Republicans are just the pure manifestation of evil. But this is the kind of vacuous tribal reaction that these algorithms are set up to get out of you. And the more we feed these things, the worse our polarization gets, and the more difficult it becomes to break that cycle of tribal rage and to even recognize it in ourselves. Especially when people are literally out there encouraging more tribalism. People have literally told me that just because tribalism is embedded in human nature, that you must therefore indulge in it. This is an encouragement to reject reason, the one thing that all human beings are born with to indulge yourself more in irrational and emotional thinking, and to avoid the notion of prudence altogether. When political tribalism gets this bad, you start thinking of people as mere abstractions. Your political opponents no longer become people anymore. And so everyday politics seems to turn into a competition of who can dehumanize the other in a quicker and more tribal fashion, so you can go back to your tribe and show them just how virtuous you are. But this tendency is in all of us. It's a fact of human nature. And I've been plenty guilty of being more tribal than necessary in the past, and I've tried my best to rectify that. In fact, our political polarization is so bad now that we are more likely to engage in negative partisanship, which is essentially the idea that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, but dumber. So if you're a Democrat and you really liked Bernie Sanders over Hillary Clinton in 2016, and you thought that Hillary was a highly corrupt person, as soon as Donald Trump attacks her by calling her corrupt, you immediately rush to her aid and defend her imminent glory. And if you're a Republican who held his nose and voted for Trump, even though you said to yourself, yeah, he's the lesser of two evils, or something, which inherently says that he is an evil, as soon as the media goes after him for lying about something new, you immediately rush to his side and claim that he never lies and he's just like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln in all their glory. It's because these people are more or less on your side. They're part of the same team. So an attack on one is an attack on all, and you must defend your tribe, especially since the enemy is so much worse. This is what a lot of our current political tribalism is all about. So while a vote for Donald Trump is more likely to be motivated by your disdain for Democrats, even when Democrats attack Donald Trump, you rush to his defense because it's the Democrats that are attacking him, and Democrats are bad, and vice versa. 
This is also why whenever a dissenting voice can be heard from your own political aisle, such as from the Never Trumpers or internecine Democratic debates, the attacks on them can at times be worse than the attacks on your political opponents. Because how can we tolerate this dissension from the tribe? Treason! This is in large part why it seems like politics is so loud and stupid. Because everyone is just defending their tribe from what they see as pure evil. And so you lose the range of nuance and stop engaging in good faith conversations. I mean, I am personally at the point now where whenever I talk to someone and they immediately say something along the lines of, well, you know, all Republicans secretly believe in the doctrines of Hitler, <laughs> or yeah, well, everyone knows Democrats love eating baby parts. I just zone out and start thinking about the fate of humanity. Actually, across the country today, more people are self-segregating themselves by political affiliation. This is what Bill Bishop called the big sort where you're less likely to encounter someone of the opposing political party, or even live next to them, and you're consequently more likely to have your worst convictions about them go uncontested, especially when it's being aided by social media algorithms and tribal personalities, to the point where your perception of the other side is wildly off base. And a recent survey from More in Common called The Perception Gap, How False Impressions Are Pulling Americans Apart, does a really good job at analyzing this. As part of their findings, they say that Democrats and Republicans imagine that almost twice as many people on the other side hold extreme views than they really do. On average, Democrats and Republicans believe that 55% of their opponents' views are extreme, but in reality, only 30% are. Americans with more partisan views hold more exaggerated views of their opponents. Consumption of most forms of media, including talk radio, newspapers, social media, and local news, is associated with a wider perception gap. Furthermore, those who post about politics on social media show a substantially larger perception gap than those who do not. They even found perception gaps among those who are most educated. Higher education among Democrats, but not Republicans, corresponds with a wider perception gap. For example, Democrats who hold a postgraduate degree are three times as inaccurate than those who did not graduate high school. This may be due in part to lower friendship diversity as higher educated Democrats, but not Republicans, are more likely to say that almost all of their friends share their political views. The wider people's perception gap, the more likely they are to attribute negative personal qualities, like hateful or brainwashed, to their opponents. Overall, Americans' views are more similar to their political opponents than they realize. They also found correlations between the type of preferred media outlet and an accurate perception of reality. So if you're spending your time reading Breitbart, listening to talk radio, or reading sites like BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, and Slate, you are much more likely to have no idea what you are talking about when it comes to how your political opponents actually think. In fact, the closer you get to religious news sources or broadcast news, the more likely you are to have a realistic picture of what's going on. And in another recent study from James Fishkin and Larry Diamond as part of their American One Room project, the more that people just have discussions with others of the opposing political party, the less entrenched their policy positions become, and the more likely they are to move to the center. As the authors of the study find, the more that Republicans engage in conversation with Democrats, the less absolutist they become with their stance on immigration, and the more they find themselves supporting visas for high-skilled workers in DACA. And the more that Democrats engage in conversation with Republicans, the less likely they are to support a $15 minimum wage, and the more likely they are to oppose basic universal income. The most polarizing proposals, whether from the left or the right, generally lost support, and a number of more centrist proposals moved to the foreground. Crucially, proposals further to the right typically lost support from Republicans, and proposals further to the left typically lost support from Democrats. My opinions have changed, more toward the center than toward any one side, noted a tattooed man in a cowboy hat from Colorado. The country is not as divided as the media make it seem. And another good thing about the reality behind the tribal hatred for one another is that according to a 2018 study by More in Common, a study of America's polarized landscape, when asked whether the differences between Americans are too big for us to work together anymore, or not so big that we cannot get together, 77% of Americans still say the latter. So while that's reassuring, the general perception that I'm getting from the public sphere still seems to suggest otherwise. Oh, and for what it's worth, we know that hostile foreign governments like Russia are deliberately pushing this kind of insane tribal outrage culture online with their bots. Because the more time they can get us hating on each other and striking division, the less we focus on what's going on outside of our country. But in summary, we're now no longer able to tolerate our political opponents. We're segregating ourselves into political identities. We are constantly fed a cycle of tribal outrage media that just keeps us angry and addicted to news all the time. But despite the fact that we're tired of it all, we still can't seem to get over it. We're addicts. Now, to avoid the perception of being that guy who wants to destroy the cars because they took my horse and carriage business away, obviously the internet has been one of the best things to have ever been introduced to the public. 
I mean, come on. The only reason you're listening to my pitiful attempts at proselytizing you is because this technology exists. The only reason why I can get obscure books with free two-day shipping is because the internet has made international shipping costs so unbelievably efficient and inexpensive. I can talk to people thousands of miles away from me. I can learn things from people that, I mean, who knows if I would have ever had access to without the internet. I think guys like Venkatesh Rao or Tyler Cowen are far more optimistic about things pertaining to the virtual world than I am, but they certainly do make worthwhile points. But anyway, that's part of the issue with social media. The good, the bad, the ear bleeding, and the fueling of tribal outrage and identity crises. This has been Political Juice. Thanks for watching. Oh, oh.